think it was probably about 1990 when Pastor Gary Chapman came out with his book, The Five Love Languages. Now, the premise behind it is, of course, that, that we all give and seek love in one of these five languages. It was a successful book. More than 11 million copies of the original book was sold, but it spawned an entire line of other materials as well. Today, there are books like The Five Love Languages of Kids, of Teenagers, of Singles, of Men and Women. And this week, I found out there's even a Five Love Languages military edition. And I'm kind of intrigued by what that one might have to say. But years ago, my family and I went to a comedian who said there's actually a sixth love language. Sarcasm. <laughs> and that's my family's love language, without a doubt, right? The thing is, it's only a love language if everybody understands it, okay? We have a friend named Joe who does not get sarcasm at all. And he, he came to me and says, Mike, for the first six months, I thought your family was the meanest family in the world. <laughs> I'm starting to think that sarcasm might actually be the Apostle Paul's love language as well. And today's scripture is kind of proof of that. Now, for some of us, we heard the words that he spoke today, and it, it might sound a little offensive or harsh, only I don't think his intent was to make people feel bad. It was to get their attention. Look again at verse 14. He says, I am not writing you to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. See, if you're a parent, you can sometimes relate to that idea, right? Right? There are times we do things to help our kids, even if they don't like it. Let's say one of your kids is about to run out into the street. You're going to scream at them or tackle them. And it's not to be mean, it's to help them. If one of your kids reaches out for a hot stove, you might slap their hand. And they think it hurt, but you're trying to save them from a bigger pain. That's essentially what Paul's intent is as well. But let me warn you. Sarcasm is not a great tool for evangelism, okay? If you go out into the world and just start being sarcastic, they're not going to get it. It doesn't work that way. But Paul wasn't writing to just anyone. He was writing to the church in Corinth. His friends, his, his faith community that he helped birth as a spiritual father. And even though Paul wrote these words 2,000 years ago to a specific church... They're still for us, and we can still learn from them. We're still called to be challenged by these words, not offended by them. And yet I'll be quick to say living the way Paul calls us to isn't always easy or simple. See, today we continue our sermon series called Don't Fit In. The idea that as Christians, we are called to live differently than the world around us. Often, we're to look and act contrary to what society says is the norm. Of course, that idea is not new. You've maybe heard that before. And it's certainly not exclusive to Christianity. Judaism and Islam and even Buddhism talk about living differently. But how we differ is what matters. See, I'm not talking about living differently just so we stand out from the world around us. We live in a society that seems to glorify individuality. The world screams at us, be yourself, be unique, don't let anyone else define you. But as a Christian, we're not just called to be different, but to be like Christ. To sacrifice, to to give of ourselves for one another. See, Paul points out that, that being a Christ follower doesn't always mean you're going to have a place of prestige in the culture around you, then or now. In many ways, the, the closer we come to following Christ, the crazier we look to the world around us. See, I think it was true for Jesus, and it's supposed to be true for us as well. 
I mean, from the incarnation coming as this baby in a manger to crucifixion and resurrection, everything Jesus did seemed to be contrary to what the world said is the way to success. Michael was talking with me this week, and he says, you know, this scripture sounds a lot like the Beatitudes when Jesus kind of turned modern understanding, conventional knowledge on its head. Matthew 5, Jesus said, he's preaching his famous Sermon on the Mount, and the, the Beatitudes, as we've come to call them, is kind of this odd list, people, Jesus, people that Jesus says are blessed, or in some translations, happy. But the list isn't what the world would expect. Blessed are the poor, or the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers and the persecuted. And the world looks at that and goes, say what? The persecuted are the happy people? Those who mourn are supposed to be happy? That's contrary to what makes sense to us. But Paul wrote this letter because, unfortunately, just a couple months after he had left Corinth, the Christians there started to act as though Christianity was just a tool for upward mobility in society. So Paul uses sarcasm to rattle their cage and get their attention. In verse 8, he writes, Already you have everything you want. Already you have become rich. I had a seminary professor tell me that when you're reading Paul's writings and you see an exclamation point, there's a pretty good chance he's being sarcastic. And that's good to know, right? Because sarcasm can be hard to catch in the written word. I mean, there's so many pieces we miss. If you don't get to see the person's expression or, or hear their tone of voice or read their body language, it's challenging to get the full meaning. We miss that sometimes in Scripture, but, but it's true in life as well. When I was in youth ministry, I, I had a young lady that she came to me and she says, Mike, why do you always seem mad when you text me? what? She says, well, you never use an exclamation point or an emoji, so I think you're always mad at me. I didn't get it, but I overcorrected, right? And so I put an exclamation point on every single sentence, and then she thought I was being sarcastic. So you, you just can't win sometimes. We miss things in that way. Now, let's be honest. Some people say they're being sarcastic, but really it's a way for them to nudge at us. <laughs> And maybe that's what Paul is doing here as well. I don't know. But either way, I'm certain his intent wasn't to, to make people feel bad, to make fun of the Corinthians. His goal was, was to shake them out of their, their proud, self-willed thinking. He wants better for them, even if it's hard to hear. See, one of the problems Paul faced with the church in Corinth is, is they sort of believed they had spiritually arrived, that, that they had everything they needed. As a community, they had been blessed, and it was one of the few places that Christians weren't being persecuted. And they sort of had this pride like, we've already got it all figured out. <laughs> the thing is, we're not immune to that today, especially in the church. Now, most of us don't go around thinking, oh, I've got it all figured out, but we often decide, well, I'm good enough. We tell ourselves, I, I'm a good person. I go to worship. I, I help people. I give to charity. And society is quick to go ahead and pat us on the back. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that we shouldn't try to be good people. That's commendable. But it is not our goal. At the core of Christianity isn't this mindset that says we are somehow good enough. It's the realization that we're not. That we are all in need of a Savior. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned, all, and have fallen short of the glory of God. 
Pastor David Guzik is a contributor to several online commentaries. And, and on today's scripture, he wrote this. He says, today the church is heavy with the same attitude of the Corinthian Christians. They were concerned about the image and worldly success and power. And many of them despised Paul and the other apostles because they did not display that image. He goes on to say, today there is no shortage of ministers who want to display the image of worldly success and power. No shortage of Christians who will only value that in their minister. I want to hit a little close to home for me. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter where I travel. It seems like any time I tell people that I'm a pastor, there are always two questions, right? What denomination and how big is your congregation? See, in the church, we, we sometimes struggle with this as well. We, we equate statistics with success <laughs> because that's what the world measures and looks at. It's a challenge <laughs> to push back to this idea in the world around us. And then for, for people like me who are people pleasers, I want everyone to like me, and that's not always the case as a Christian. <laughs> I have a, a mentor that always tells me, he says, Mike, if everyone in your church is happy with you, you're probably not challenging them enough. He's right, I just hate it, you know. I want people to like me. I want to honor Christ more. The thing is, Paul offers a, a different perspective. Listen to verse 10. He says, we are fools for the sake of Christ, but you are sensible people in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored, but we are dishonored. He looks at them and he says, as the apostles, we're living differently than you. We, we look different than you, and it's meant to cause pause, right? And then you get to verse 13. He says, we have become like rubbish to the world, the dregs of all things. You know, dreg is essentially the sludge that's in the bottom of a barrel. What an attractive way, right? What an attractive understanding of who we're supposed to be. I mean, you listen to that and you go, so is Paul just complaining here? Is this like a biblical era pity party or a woe is me moment? I don't think that's what Paul's getting at. See, Paul is trying to help his friends understand this, this upside down gospel. Where the first are last and the last are first. This world where those who mourn are happy and those who are persecuted are blessed. He's trying to tell them that, that our mission is not to be powerful, but humble. Not to be in charge, but in service to others. This week I was, was so intrigued by the language he uses in verse 9. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, as though sentenced to death because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and humans. I mean, if Paul's intent is to say, you should imitate me, this doesn't sound like a really great strategy, right? The thing is, Paul is trying to convince them that they are to live differently than the world around them. That, that language was so intriguing to me, I had to dig a little deeper this week. And it turns out, this is one of those places that the original audience probably caught the imagery that we in our modern society miss. Now, Corinth, like most places Paul went, was under Roman authority at the time. And scholars believe that, that this was kind of alluding to one of two different things. One is that idea of the, the gladiators that would go into the arena. And in this era, those gladiators would fight to the death. 
But before they entered the ring, they would look to the emperor and they would say, Moraturi salutimus. Sorry, my Latin's not very good, but something in that mean, means. And it, it essentially says, we who are about to die salute you. So there are some scholars that point to this and say, that's what Paul's doing. He's, he's saluting or tipping his hat to the Corinthian church saying, I'm prepared to die. Are you? Or other scholars will, will point to this era in Roman authority where when a city is conquered or an uprising is squashed, the Roman general leads a parade through the streets. And in the front of this parade is all of the soldiers decked out in all their regalia. And next comes all of the spoils of war, all of the things they found and pulled out from this victory. And at the end, in rags and chains, are the prisoners being marched to their death. In Greek, the word here that, that we translate as spectacle is called theatron. And it, it's essentially the same word we translate into theater. We are on display, a spectacle. The crazy thing is, if, if you look at the history of this, when Paul wrote this letter in probably 54 AD, it was the same year that Emperor Nero came to power. Now, Nero turned out to be pretty crazy. <laughs> he made a sport out of killing Christians. Pulling them into the arena and, and killing them in the most horrific ways. Paul says, we are a spectacle. We are last of all condemned to death. Paul saying, being a Christian, it's not for the faint at heart. It's not supposed to be for us either. Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia was once speaking at a Knights of Columbus gathering, and he said this. He said, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools, and he has not been disappointed. He goes on to say, if I have brought any message today, it's this. Have the courage to have your wisdom regarded as stupidity. Be fools for Christ. And have the courage to suffer the contempt of a sophisticated world. The question we're left to wrestle with is what, what does that mean for us? What does it look like in the modern church today to live differently and, and to not fit in with the world? Is our goal that somehow we're supposed to be hated? Is our goal to tell those people outside the church how horrible and awful they are and how sinful they are? Are we not successful Christians until the world calls us crazy? I don't know if that's what he's trying to tell us. I think his challenge is to say, don't make your decisions based on what the world thinks, but what God thinks. It means as Christians, we should live differently. We should give more generously. We should love more passionately. We should serve more faithfully than the world around us. Not because of the accolades but because that's how we honor Christ. Verse 16, Paul writes to them, he says, I appeal to you then, be imitators of me. I mean, can you imagine, think for a minute, what, what the Corinthians must have thought when they heard that line, right? Somebody's reading this letter to them and they get to this point, I'm guessing their first thought is, say what? <laughs> you want us to be like you? <clears throat> Wait a minute. When you go to a town, they kick you out or they beat you up and throw you in prison. The world calls you weak and crazy. 
You just told us that you're poor and hungry and naked and homeless. You want me to be like you? Say what? People see you and say, that's the rubbish? That's my goal? Paul's not telling them you should suffer all of these things for Christ, but he's saying despite these things, you should still serve Christ. Imitate me because that's how God works miracles. It is through our brokenness and our weakness the world can see God's strength. When we do things for Christ that the world sees as crazy, maybe that's the first real glimpse of Christ they get to see. One of my modern-day heroes is a, a pastor named Mark Batterson. And he started a church in Washington, D.C. And he continues to do things that the world looks at and says, that's a little crazy, right? Like, His church was worshiping about a 1,000 people a week, and they still didn't have a building. They were just meeting in movie theaters. One of the first properties they ever bought was a burnt-out crack house that they decided to turn into a coffee house. Years later, it almost completely funds their missions program. In one of his books, he writes this. He says, crazy miracles are the offspring of a crazy faith. How I want to be crazy for Christ. How I want to do things the world thinks are crazy so that they can see Christ in you and me. Here's the thing. (laughs) If we want to honor God, if we truly want to be the best for Christ to transform this world, we have to live differently. We have to do what people think is crazy and impossible so that they can see that God is truly the one making it all happen. The challenge for all of us is is how do we become faithful fools what's the crazy thing god might be calling you to do is god nudging you to say maybe you should work towards tithing or go beyond maybe god is nudging you saying you're not supposed to just be in a small group you're supposed to lead a small group Maybe God is nudging you to to start a new ministry or outreach in the community. Maybe God is nudging you saying, you're not supposed to just clap for those cool youth that went on a mission trip. You're supposed to be a sponsor for them. And if you go, whew, that feels crazy. Maybe that's God. So here's the thing. The next time the first thought in your head is that that idea is crazy, maybe it's God. (laughs) Maybe it's God saying, if you would live different, oh, how the world could see me in you. Because when we, when we decide to be fools for Christ, that's when God does miracles. That's when God changes us and helps us change the world as well. Church, I don't know what it is God may be calling you to as an individual, but I'm confident that he is calling us as a church to live different, to be fools for Christ, and to let our craziness change the world for Christ. Amen? Amen. Would you pray with me? Loving and gracious God, we, we are so thankful we get the opportunity to gather together, to worship with one another, to be the church in different ways. 
And yet, God, we are, are quick to confess that sometimes this call that you have on our lives feels intimidating or, or overwhelming or crazy. Sometimes, God, we feel this nudge on our heart like you have called us to do the impossible or the outright crazy in the world. God, help us to embrace that. To be fine with the world thinking we're foolish as long as you know we are faithful. God, help us to step out of our comfort zones and find the places you are calling us to transform the world because of your love. We thank you, God, that you have called us to be faithful fools just for you. In your name we ask it. Amen. Amen.